Welcome back students. In our previous videos, I've been talking about how the early stages, the early steps of quantum theory allowed physicists to model experimental results in a way that classical mechanics and classical physics had not yet been able to do. So this new quantum approach based on the idea that uh, energy is quantized was quite a breakthrough as a new model of thinking about uh, the physical universe. So when we get to Niels Bohr's work, uh, adapting Rydberg's constant and using quantum theory to explain line spectra in the hydrogen atom, it's a pretty amazing step forward in our understanding or mo ability to model the, the physical universe. However, Bohr's model for the quantized energy levels for electrons still did not explain why. It didn't explain why electrons behave that way. It was just a model that provided a better fit for the experimental results. Well, 12 years later, a French researcher named Louis de Broglie came up with an equation that connected the wavelength of an electron with its mass and its speed. So we end up getting the de Broglie equation, and there's h, we've seen h before, is the Planck constant. And now we are thrown back into the view of energy not only behaving as waves, but also as particles. A particle can have a mass, and it can be traveling at a certain speed, a certain velocity. And that particle with a certain mass and velocity now has a wavelength associated with it. So this particle now has a wavelength associated with it. So that's what this section is about. Wait a minute, energy behaves as both waves and particles? And we know that this has been a debate going on since the 1600s, right? And yes, it is true. Energy can be modeled both as waves and as particles. And both models have predictive value in being able to explain some of the experimental results that we see. So the idea that energy behaves as both waves and particles is called the wave-particle duality. Wave, particle, duality. And the word duality just means that there are two aspects to its nature. It behaves as a wave, it behaves as a particle, so its nature, its characteristics are like waves and particles, so it's a wave-particle duality. So in fact any particle, even a very large one, has a wavelength associated with it. A planet does, a baseball does, you and I do, we have our own wavelengths. But for very large objects like you and I and baseballs and things that we can actually encounter on the macroscopic scale, the wavelengths are very, very small. They're insignificantly small. And so we don't encounter macroscopic objects as if they were waves. When you look at me, you don't see a wave. When I look at you, I don't see a wave. We see macroscopic objects with physical mass. But you can see that in this equation, as the mass, which is in the denominator, becomes very, 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 very small, then the wavelength gets larger. And so the wavelength does become significant. So the de Broglie equation is really useful for dealing with small particles like electrons and protons. Nevertheless, any particle, even a very large one, has a wavelength associated with it. And the wavelength associated with a physical particle, it's called its de Broglie wavelength. And it's related to the mass and the velocity. Of the particle. So let me write this so that it's not uh, all in one line. Planck's constant in the numerator, mass times velocity in the denominator. And as you can see, because mass and velocity are in the denominator here, this is Planck's constant, then as mass becomes smaller, then the wavelength becomes larger. As the speed or velocity becomes smaller, the wavelength 
becomes larger. I want to be very careful that you notice that this is m for mass and not m for meters. And that this is v for velocity or speed and not nu, that Greek letter for frequency that looks sort of like a v. Okay? What units of mass must we have in this equation? Well, you remember that the units for Planck's constant are joule seconds. And you may remember from way back a week or two ago when we talked about the unit of mass in a joule are kilograms. So the mass must be in kilograms. So the mass must be in kilograms. And the velocity must be in meters per second. Okay? So make those two notes here. So I'm going to give you an example here, and this is not a type of an example that I would typically give you for a de Broglie wavelength problem, because this problem is asking about a macroscopic particle, a baseball. Nevertheless, usually we only calculate de Broglie wavelengths for subatomic particles like electrons, or protons, for example. But in this case, I'm going to do it for a baseball, okay? So, what is the wavelength of a 5.11 ounce, that's a regulation baseball, and I'm giving you the, the, the metric equivalent in grams of that baseball, traveling at 90.0 miles per hour. That's a decent fastball. 90.0 miles per hour, and then I went ahead and I converted it to 40.2 meters per second. So I've done some of the conversions for you already. You'll need to convert this grams to kilograms before you can plug it into this equation. So just as a reminder, a joule is one kilogram meter squared per second squared. So the kilogram is in the joule, and that's why that mass has to be in kilograms. Okay? So with that in mind, go ahead and do this problem. Pause the video, complete that work, get the answer and the correct sig figs and units. And when you're done, resume the video and then I'll work through it. Go ahead. All right, so we've got a, uh, we're being asked here for a wavelength of a particle. And we know this is a clue that a wave, when you're being asked for a wavelength of a particle and not a wavelength of electromagnetic radiation, then we're going to use the wavelength for a particle equation, the de Broglie equation. So we're calculating a de Broglie wavelength. So we're not going to be using C equals lambda nu. We're going to be using the de Broglie equation. Okay? So here we have the de Broglie equation, the de Broglie wavelength equals Planck's constant over mass times velocity. So I'm going to start plugging in values. I know what my uh, Planck's constant is, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds. The mass is in 145 grams, but I need it in kilograms. So let's do a quick conversion here. 145 grams. And I have grams to kilograms equals kilograms, right? So I have 1,000 grams in one kilogram, and so I have 0 0.145 kilograms. So I, now I can plug that in for my mass, 0 0.145 kilograms. Where's my velocity? It has to be in meters per second. And I've given it to you here, 40.2 meters per second. Oops, meters per second. And there I have my numbers. So all I have to do is plug that into my calculator and get my answer. Rounded to three sig figs, which is 1.14 times 10 to the negative 34th. My units are going to, it's a wavelength. So the length here is in meters. And I'll show you how the units give me that here in just a moment. But I want to make sure that we've got the right answer here. 
All right, so does it make sense that this would be an extremely small wavelength? Well, yes, remember that the larger we get for an object, as its mass increases, the wavelength is going to decrease. It's going to be a very small wavelength. And if it's a particle that you can actually see, like a baseball, then its wavelength is going to be so small that you are not going to be able to recognize that this particle has any wave nature to it. This wavelength is so small, it's incredibly, inconceivably small, that when we see a baseball traveling, we do not see its wave nature. We just see it as a particle moving through space. All right. I want to show you how we get the meters here because one of the questions that often comes up in class is, how do these units cancel out? You have joules there. We don't have it anywhere, uh, kilograms shown anywhere. So I'm going to show you, uh, our problem is done. We've, we've completed the problem All right, with the solution. But I'm going to set aside a little box here and show you how this, this unit analysis works. So we have Planck's constant, which is a uh, lambda, which is meters, right? And we have Planck's constant, which is joule seconds. And we have mass, which is kilograms. And we have velocity, which is meters per second. And if you just look at this, you'll say, wait a minute, I don't see how the joules cancel. I don't see if the kil kilograms cancel to give me meters. Well, let me use what we know to be the definition of the joule over here. And I think you'll start to see what's happening here. Where the joule is in this equation, I'm going to plug in these units because this is what a joule is. So for joule, I'm going to put kilogram meter squared per second squared. And that is now the joule. And then times uh, the seconds, right? Because Planck's constant is joule seconds. So there's the joule and there's the seconds. So there's my numerator. That's joule seconds, right? Joule seconds. And then in the denominator, I have mass in kilograms and velocity in meters per second. And now I, I think you can see how this is going to happen. So I'm going to switch colors here so you can see as I'm canceling these things out. Kilograms now can cancel out, right? And now you see it's starting to take shape. I have a second here and a second squared here. So that second and one of these seconds will cancel. And so now I have an inverse second here and an inverse second here. So they will cancel. And now I have a meter square up here and a meter here. And this will cancel out one of those. And look at what I'm left with right there. It's like magic. Look at that. And that's how we get our meters for our wavelength. Okay, so that's an example of calculating a de Broglie wavelength. And again, if you're being asked to calculate the wavelength of a particle, like a proton or an electron, this is not a photon. Photons are not considered particles with mass, but a proton or an electron, and you have the mass and the velocity of those particles, then the wavelength you're going to calculate is going to be the de Broglie wavelength. Okay? So notice that I am not using C equals lambda nu in this equation. All right. So that's how we do that. This brings us to the realization that now we have had seen two different methods of calculating wavelengths, lambdas. We have a method of calculating a wavelength if you're given energy or frequency. And the equations that we use for that are these right there. So if you're asked for the energy or frequency of a photon, for example, then you'll be using this method. Or we have a different method of calculating a wavelength, a de Broglie wavelength, 
if you're given the mass and velocity. And for that, we use the de Broglie equation. And again, this is V for velocity, not nu, even though they kind of look similar. Okay, So if you're given the mass and velocity of a particle, then you can calculate its de Broglie wavelength. And so you might see this for a proton or an electron, for example. So be very careful. This is a source of confusion for students. Notice very similar sounding words, photon and proton. A photon is a quantum of electromagnetic radiation, and we use these equations. A proton is a particle that has mass, and so we would use the de Broglie equation. Okay, and that is the de Broglie wavelength.